Okay, let's get going here. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, I'm Philip Schultz. I'm the chairman of the board of the Olmsted Network, and I'd like to welcome you all uh, on this rather early morning in fall uh, to the 2023 Olmsted Network Natural National Conference. Uh, we're here to enjoy and celebrate Frederick Law Olmsted and his firm's enduring contribution to parks and landscapes for everyone. Uh, we have attendees here from across the nation, and we welcome you all to Milwaukee uh, and Wisconsin. I just, uh, I was, as we were preparing for this conference, I was reflecting a little bit on why am I involved in parks? Uh, and uh, it was very interesting because we had to do a lot of planning for this event. And uh, I realized it really uh, occurred for me back in 1973 uh, when I was fortunate enough to be an um, uh, overseas uh, student in London uh, for a year. And London uh, obviously is a very big, bustling city. And uh, fortunately, I was uh, very close to Kensington Gardens and Hyde Park. And I was really... Uh, blown away, to be honest, as a young uh, kid, going into a park uh, in, in such a big city, I think it's about 340 acres, uh, that was full of people from all over the world. I mean, it was sort of like the front yard of London. There were Londoners, there were tourists, there were people from Jamaica, there were students, there were uh, people from Africa and India all sort of enjoying the park together. And that really made a huge impression on me, and I spent a lot of time in that park. Uh, fast forward to the 1980s, when my wife and I bought our first home, uh, just off of Newberry Boulevard, which is the Olmsted Boulevard between Lake Park and Riverside Park. We intentionally bought there because of those parks, uh, partially because of my our memories of that time. Uh, and in those days, um, Riverside Park, which we'll see tomorrow, uh, was basically a, a giant homeless encampment and an area where a lot, there was a lot of drug dealing. So it was not a great place uh, at all. And I became involved very quickly with um, the Urban Ecology Center, which was in that park housed in a double-wide trailer, uh, and have worked with them over the past uh, 40 years uh, as they have really brought that park back to life in a different form than the original Olmsted design, but they really brought the park uh, back to life. Um, and then I also became involved in Lake Park Friends, again, for over 40 years. Uh, we have over 500 members. Ann Hamilton, our president, is, is here from Lake Park. Uh, that group has done wonders in terms of really making sure that we Steward Lake Park. Uh, we'll see some examples are the footbridge from 1906, uh, which the county wanted to take down and put in a very simple, you know, steel structure. Uh, we worked for seven years to make sure that that historic renovation occurred. Um, so I, I, I bring that up just to say it, it's nice uh, over the next three days to sort of reflect on how we all got involved in parks and how much they mean to us personally, as well as the community. Uh, the Milwaukee County Parks Commission was established in uh, 1889. Uh, Christian Wall, who was the president of the commission, wisely hired Frederick L. Olmsted to design three parks for the system. Uh, the Olmsted design principles and aesthetics represented in Lake Park, Riverside, and Washington Park would be carried on in the development of over 150 county parks, including over 15,000 acres of public land. Uh, so this is an incredible achievement. And you'll, if you get to any of the other parks, you'll see that they all kind of look like Olmsted parks. They really follow that design aesthetic. The result is that uh, although Milwaukee County is, is only the 61st largest county in the country in terms of population, uh, we're the 18th in the country in terms of ex accessibility to parkland within a 10-minute walk. So it's really a wonderful uh, feature of this county uh, that we have that much parkland. 
Of course, having that much parkland and not that much population is a blessing and a challenge. And we'll see over the next three days, um, as we discuss the preservation of our parks and landscapes like Yerkes Observatory, how uh, difficult this can be. Uh, parks are where we as a community can gather and enjoy life together. Uh, this has not always been the reality in our parks here in Milwaukee uh, due to segregation and income disparities. Uh, this is an issue for Washington Park that uh, is being addressed now uh, with the neighborhood groups and the residents in terms of how do we rejuvenate this park uh, and make it a really a center uh, piece of the community. Um, but we know from experience, if you look at Central Park, Prospect Park, Lake Park, that these great parks can really be a catalyst for change, that they become a focal point for the community. And uh, if enough work is done on preservation and stewardship and safety and access to these parks, um, it really helps bring uh, the community together and improve the quality of life for everyone. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank uh, our sponsors, uh, Fund Development Corporation uh, and Elizabeth Meyer uh, for sponsoring us, and the J. Jeffers Corporation, uh, Mame McCulley from that group may be here at some point today. Um, they do wonderful historic restoration work, so if you have a project in your city uh, and if you can get a hold of Mame, she would love to talk to you about that. I'd also like to thank David uh, Boucher, or I would say Boucher, uh, uh, from the Amaranth Bakery for the wonderful uh, food we had this morning. Uh, Anne-Marie Sawkins, who's helped a lot on getting this thing put together. Uh, Villa Terrace, Virginia Small, uh, the Lake Geneva Garden Club, our Olmstead Network Planning Committee, who worked long and hard. Uh, Kathy Keene, who's helped out quite a bit. Um, the Washington Park Media Center, and of course, Milwaukee County Parks, um, who's done a lot to help us out in, in um, uh, working on the parks. Um, Lake Park Friends, uh, thanking them for their work. Uh, Washington Park Friends, we have Kevin Driscoll, who is the acting president of that group here with us today. Um, uh, and the Yerkes Observatory, all three for hosting us in their landscapes. Lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Didi Petri uh, and Leslie Jacobs um, and Victoria, who is not with us today, but who are ill. These are, these are the people who actually made this thing happen <clears throat> and did all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Without them, we would just be taking a tour, I think. That would be about it. <laughs> So we appreciate your hard work in pulling everything together. I hope you enjoy the conference and our great Olmstead landscapes. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phil, and good morning, everyone. It is so great to see all of you here. And as you have heard, we are delighted to have people coming from across the country. We have folks here today from Seattle, Portland, St. Louis, Palos Verdes, New York City, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Boston, and I must add, Paris, because we are very lucky to have Loic Maceos with us. He is the Charles Beveridge Fellow, and he will be here with us throughout the three days. He is working on a thesis on Frederick Law Olmsted, so we are delighted to have him amongst us and to have traveled so far. I do think that one of the real advantages of these conferences is not only to learn from our speakers, but to learn from each other. And so I hope we will do that throughout the next three days. This is our first national conference since 2019, uh, pre-pandemic, uh, and after a very successful 200th birthday year. I want to thank those in the room who participated last year, and particularly Milwaukee, which was very passionately engaged in the bicentennial. 
I am also happy to say that this conference marks the first anniversary of the naming of the Olmstead Way. And if you haven't seen the Olmstead Way sign, you will see it before we depart today. We are so grateful to the County Board of Supervisors who passed a resolution to honor the work and principles of Frederick Law Olmstead and to draw attention to his work here in Milwaukee. I think when we go to New York City, when we go to Chicago, there is quite a deal of attention and interest paid to Olmstead, a little less so in Milwaukee. And so I want to thank the supervisors for helping us to draw attention to that work. And we will hear from them later today. This conference offers us an opportunity to initiate important conversations about the ways the built environment can advance social justice, equity, and sustainability, all of these principles of Frederick Law Olmsted's work. We do take parks for granted, but before Olmsted, parks were largely the property of the rich and privileged. And it was he who believed that public spaces, urban and national parks, should be a right of all Americans. Indeed, he referred to the creation of Central Park in 1858, and I quote, as a democratic development of the greatest significance. A parks for all people was the tagline of the Olmsted Bicentennial, but we know now, 200 years later, that we still have much to do before we achieve this goal. While we do have a great accessibility in this city, we know, nevertheless, that there are 28 million people in America who do not live within 10 minutes of a park, and that black and brown communities typically have far less green space. We know that even when parks exist, many populations do not feel welcome. And we know that in many cities, maintenance dollars are not allocated equally. So how do we make sure we have healthy, vibrant parks? How do we help draw attention to Milwaukee's very rich Olmsted heritage? How do we, as many of you in this room have suggested, make Washington Park Milwaukee's Central Park? And how do we adapt historic parks to modern needs while retaining their soul? These are some of the questions that we're going to answer today as we look at the Olmsted heritage in Milwaukee and at Lake Geneva. I want to quote from Michael Carrier, from whom we will hear later today. Our goal is to spark inspiration and conversation, to put Olmsted in conversation with new actors so that we can reinvent and adapt his ideas for today's challenges. It is now my pleasure to introduce our kickoff speaker, who, as they say, needs no introduction, uh, Virginia Small, who has been so immensely helpful to us in the planning of this conference. Virginia, as you know, was a senior editor at Fine Gardening. I have magazines that I've saved for decades now uh, that have her editorship in them. And she, of course, is a real expert uh, on the Olmsted in Milwaukee and in this area. Uh, her full bio can be found uh, online, and I will just bring her on and say, Virginia, thank you so much for your help in getting us here, and we look forward to your entering us into the Olmsted sphere. Thank you so much. Okay, well, here we go. So thank you all for being here. There's a lot of faces who are familiar to me. So I um, will be talking today about Olmsted's legacies in Milwaukee. And we are right in the middle of, of one of them, and this is the Washington Park Senior Center. We'll have a little bit of reference of what, of what this was before it, it was, you know, this senior center. Um, so I have a lot of images, and I have a lot of stories to tell, and I am, I am going to keep it within the, the bounds as, as Dee Dee has uh, requested. And of course, I know this is a very full conference, and we're going to have many opportunities to talk about a lot of different things. So whatever, if I have an image and I thought I was going to say something about it and I just have to skip over it, we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to actually see that place probably during the course of the next couple of days. Um, so we're talking about Frederick Law Olmsted and his Milwaukee legacies. And I, I have that as a plural because there's, there's more than we actually think about um, on, that are the, the obvious ones, and we'll, we'll look at all of those, but then there's some other ones as well. 
So the, uh, we'll start with just a few images. This you may be familiar to you. This is a view of Washington Park. You can see the band shell in the distance, which is one of the, the signature places of Washington Park. It was not built during the Olmsted era, but it very much carried on a legacy uh, because there was always a band shell in the park. Um, there was a smaller one to start with. And um, before we begin, I'd like to uh, do a, a land and water acknowledgement. Uh, we acknowledge here in Milwaukee that we are on traditional Potawatomi, Ho-Chunk, and Menominee homeland along the southwest shores of Michigami, North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the Milwaukee, Menominee, and Kinnikinnick rivers meet, and the people of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain present. Uh, uh, the reason that we have these uh, water acknowledgments, what land and water acknowledgments, they help us to remember these nations and the ancestors who were the longtime stewards of places where we now live and enjoy. Recognizing our ancestors can help us to fully understand our histories, all of our histories, and to inform thoughtful stewardship. So why are, are we, uh, another part of what we'll, we'll look at is a, is a, a historic mount, a mount uh, marker in Lake Park, but why, why do we study the past? You know, a lot of people go, well, you know, we're, we're living in today. Um, study the past, the past is prologue, as Plato said. But there's so many, so many things. The past is never really over, but it informs so much. And the more that we know about it, I think the more that we can appreciate and make connections that are meaningful, that, that support us in so many different ways. And places are very much a part of that. So uh, part of what's in, in uh, Lake Park is, uh, is an Indian mound. It's the, the, the last, it's one of the last remaining ones. There's really a couple others, but it's, it's the, um, an, uh, from the 300 BC to 400 AD area, there was, of uh, uh, the, uh, woodland Indians, middle woodland culture. And this conical burial mound is the last remaining of a group of mounds that were destroyed in the building of the park. It is also of the last two known remaining Indian mounds in the city of Milwaukee of about 200 that were documented by Increase Lapham in his book, Antiquities of Wisconsin. And that's an important thing. We'll, uh, in, Increase Lapham was somebody who, who was aware of the, the significance, e even as he was part of redevelopment of lands that, that he documented. So this is where that image is in Lake Park. Um, it's, uh, it's the, 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 uh, the mound is, um, we'll, we, we'll probably see it from, I don't know if we'll actually go directly there, but we'll see it. It's near Newberry Boulevard, a little bit to the north um, and east. Okay. So here we have a few images of the different Olmsted parks. Now this is Washington Park on one of the many wonderful Washington Park Wednesdays events that are held for uh, eight Wednesdays in, in the summer. And I think they are one of the most um, exciting uh, community events that, that I uh, attend all summer. And this is uh, just one of the, the many, uh, many images from that. Here we have River Park, a Riverside Park. This is still, this is uh, borders the Milwaukee River, and it was, we'll see a little bit of, of more of the historic images of that. But that was, uh, it's still very much in use as part of that park. Uh, but uh, for a long time, the, we, we turned the city, we turned our back on the Milwaukee River because it became so polluted. And so that's also part of the history. It's maybe, not, it's not a part of the history that sometimes we want to celebrate, but we need to know, like, sort of the outcomes, the, the consequences of decisions that are made over generations often. Um, now, this is Newberry Boulevard. This is also, um, a, a, it's on the National Register. It's part of the Newberry Boulevard Historic District. So this is marked. We'll go by this. We'll, we'll, you'll, you'll see it from um, at, when you come to the Lake Park Bistro. Um, it, it'll be right across from that uh, when you come to, the, to that restaurant tonight. And uh, there's also, um, so we'll go, we'll, so now we'll talk a little bit about who, who was this Frederick Olmsted guy. Now, 
Now, I'm talking to the choir here, of course, a lot of you, but I also know that there's some people who may not be as familiar, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about Frederick Law Olmsted, um, someone, of course, who I think has, has been influencing my life before I ever even knew it, um, and I'll, I'll explain why in a, in a bit. So, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, uh, as we celebrated his bicentennial of his birth last year, but he said, I have all my life been considering distant effects. And he meant that as he did many things on many levels. He was a very much of a, of a poet of use in the way he used words, but he was also a, a, a very pragmatic person. And so what he was talking about was that when he designed something, he was thinking about what was it going to look like in a hundred years. And I think that we can have that same sort of forward thinking today. I think we desperately need it. I think that's what we're all called to do. Um, but I think he, he presented a model for that. And we can also see the outcomes of that. So who was Frederick Hall Olmsted? Well, he was a futurist, first and foremost, um, a far-sighted trailblazer, whether as a scientific farmer, an author, a journalist who was the first person to be reporting in the antebellum South to report on slavery in in the ways of that that really told the story that had stories that had not been told and that are still in print because he still considered the 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 most forthright uh, writer about the the horrors of slavery and the problems that it engendered for the entire culture, not just in the in the South but in the North as well. Um, he was a publisher, a park maker, an early conservationist. So many other things. You can, it, you, there's more than you can even, you know, say. But ver biographers have variously called Olmsted a practical utopian, a man of vision who could get things done, which is, I think, wonderful. A genius of place, that's the title of one of the books about him, and the most important American historical figure that the average person knows least about. So that's why I like talking about Olmsted, because there's a, like, you know, he was really influential, but a lot of us don't know about him. And I didn't, I didn't either, even though I, uh, I was influenced by being in his spaces, the spaces he's designed. Here's a, just a couple of the, the books about him or by him. So the one in the middle is a, a very good a biograph, a biography, Genius of Place. And then the one on the right, uh, Spying on the South, is one of the more recent, but there's been several since then, um, where he, it, tra it retraces his travels in the South during those years, uh, three years reporting for what was the nascent New York Times. And, and so Tony Horowitz, a wonderful writer, revisited as all the places that he could and, and described what he sees today, what, what were remnants, what, what has changed. And it also gives you a real sense of what it was like for him to be on the road, on horseback, riding around the South, being an undercover journalist. He never, he took all this, did all this amazing journalism, and he wasn't sitting there taking notes. He would go back to his rooms or his, his, his tent or wherever and, uh, and write up what he, who he talked to that day, what he saw. So, um, Oh, I uh, welcome whoever's coming in the, in the door. Um, another book is called "A Clearing in the Distance," and that's a term that he would he would use. That was something of an image again, where he was he would imagine that you would see something and then you would eventually move toward that. That's that same picture that's that was taken in Prospect Park that I showed earlier of the long view. That's the long. That's actually Long Meadow. And then there's this famous bridge in in uh, Central Park. That's in the middle. Um, so the, the, the wealth of, um, knowledge about Olmsted, it's, it's wonderful, it's sort of endless, but I think there's, uh, by coming together and talking, all of us are here today, we're part of that, we're part of those stories. We wouldn't be here if we didn't have some tie to some place that Frederick L. Olmsted had a role in. Here's a couple of other new books. This is uh, Olmsted, Olmsted and Yosemite. A lot of people don't realize that he wrote a report in 1865 about protecting and conserv conserving Yosemite for all. Now, again, there's a lot of other histories about Yosemite. Those were also included in this book. You know, that that, that was not a what we think of as pristine wilderness was a very popular concept in America. No, there was no pristine anything. But that 
but there was a sense of what do we do with this now that we are here. So here in Milwaukee, we have a lot of, um, a lot of legacies. Uh, as a visionary landscape architect, Olmsted and his colleagues, they influenced many aspects of life in Milwaukee. The fostering of democracy through parks for all people, the aesthetics of the parks and other green spaces that we see and enjoy, urban planning and ideas about connectivity. Like we'll talk a lot about parks, but Olmsted was very much an urban planner for all the parts of the city. Well, how does this all connect? The introduction of parkways and green boulevards, the development of an interlinked park system. You know, we, we are part of, of, right here is part of the Milwaukee County Park System. This was a concept that Olmsted and Calvert Box invented, the, the actual phrase and concept. Ensuring that mass transit made early parks accessible to all. I, don't, I learned this not that long ago. It was, Olmsted insisted that these parks that he was designing would have streetcars bringing people to them because otherwise they would not be accessible. That's still an issue sometimes in Milwaukee because we have a lakefront and we do not have any mass transit that goes to it. Now people do manage to get in cars, but sometimes people were like, charge people to park on the <laughs> along the lakefront and people were like uh, um, and then most of all uh, I think Olmsted's influences helped to make Milwaukee livable green and resilient and all of these things remain relevant today this is not we're not talking about the past we really are talking about very much what's happening today challenges we face as well as things we enjoy so uh, of course, Olmsted did, did not come um, full blown, out, you know, out of the head of Zeus. Um, he was he was influenced by many other things. He was a man of his time, and one of the people that he was influenced by um, uh, was Andrew Jackson Downing. He was somebody we certainly know very little about. Although uh, for one of the first times I met Dave Boucher, who will be on this panel. He um, knew about Andrew Jackson Downing. He knows a lot about this urban history. And he said his house that he lives on over here near the, in, in the west side was actually um, a part of the, of the architectural influence of Andrew Jackson Downing. So anyway, but he was, Downing was considered the most influential tastemaker and early advocate uh, for a central park in New York City. Um, he did a lot of different things. He was, I think, I'd call him kind of the Martha Stewart of his day. Uh, he was a young man when he died, but he, through the, the Horticulturist, the Journal of Rural Art and Rural Taste, he, um, he was very much in, in the forefront of thinking about what, what are people going to want to beautify their, their homes, their landscapes, whatever. Um, there are some things that people think that, that they take issue about what Downing did, but most of all, he really was a, he was a, a horticulturist. His family had a nursery in uh, Newburgh, New York, but he was very much a, a thinking person. And as I said, he had these, these ideas uh, per, um, promulgated through the horticulturist, and Frederick Olmsted was one of the authors and one of the contributors. So, but one of the things he was, he lived near New York City, and there was a group of people, and he was among them, that believed that New York, in order to be livable, needed to have a central park. And they were calling it a central park. It eventually became called Central Park. But sadly, um, uh, Andrew Jackson Downing died in a steamboat accident at a young age. And he, um, as a result, then, you know, there was some things that, that, that really affected. But he had brought over, as part of his team, to, he had brought over Calvert Vox, um, um, an architect from England. And he had met uh, Vox in 1850 and enlisted him to become his partner and moved to America. Then all of a sudden, Calvert Vox is in America, and about two years later, um, it, Downing had died. So. Uh, Calvert Fox stayed on in America, and he also was already invested in the idea of a central park. So the rest we know a little bit is history, is that Olmsted and Vox became partners. And, but before there was a concept of central park, Olmsted had been off doing things. He was always a self-taught person. He was traveling. He went to England. He visited one of the first public parks in uh, England. It was, or it was the first public park in England. It was, it was, um, um, 
Birkenhead, right, I'm sorry, I should have put that name on there. It was right here, Birkenhead in Liverpool. So he visited there in 1850, around that same era. So, and it was designed by uh, Thomas Paxton, and it, you can see these flowing lines and such. It was very much the kind of style that was popular, becoming popularized in, Eng in England of a, a naturalistic landscapes. But he, but the thing that most impressed Olmsted, and he wrote about it, because he wrote uh, about his walks and talks of an American farmer in England, is that he was impressed about the fact that it was a public park, supported by public money, and that people, one of the aspects of it was a promenade, where people were walking past each other, seeing each other, and he believed that this was essential to people being in a democracy. Now, England was not a democracy, but he thought, here we are, we're trying to have a democracy. This is 1850, this is a, you know, some decades on from when we've actually created a, you know, an aspirational uh, government. And he was like, no, in order for us to really have a democracy, we have to have places where people can gather and be equal and see each other. So anyway, so that's where he comes into to helping to do, he, he and Calvert Vox designed what became the plan for Central Park. There were a lot of other plans submitted. And he, um, and, and you can see this just, uh, you know, a little bit, the, the, the layout, you know, has some of those curving lines and all that. But it's, but the, the concepts, it's very, it's so big. I mean, I'm sure many of you, all of you have probably been to Central Park at some point, right? But, there, but the ideas that were laid out there were very much um, so, things that, that Olmsted continued to develop. And he continued to develop them in different places. I loved, um, this, is, this was just a random scene in uh, Prospect Park a couple of summers ago. And look at all those things are going on. And, and this is what, it, what a, a park for all people means, is that people can do what they want and make, you know, if they wanna do, they wanna do yoga or they wanna canoodle or whatever, what do they wanna do? Um, so he was, um, so he, he began developing these parks at, at a pretty a fast clip eventually in the eight, you know beginning in the 1850s and then the 1860s um, but and then he designed the the park system in Boston that's called the Emerald Necklace which was a, a linear park system and it's also considered the first green infrastructure par project the, the muddy river portion of it and these are part of the things that a lot of people have a little bit of a glimpse of, Imps, of Olmsted, and they'll think, well, he is the guy, he was only concerned about blah, blah, blah. Or he only did you know, projects where he completely transformed the land. None of that is true. Whatever Olmsted, Olmsted did with so many different things that you, it's really hard to pin down and say that that's exactly who he was. Because, yes, he would t change the topography if need be, but he also would work with, with existing topography and work and really solve problems. I think more than anything, he was a problem solver. And he was a very idealistic person, but when it came down to solving a problem, he was to figure out, like, what are we gonna do? How's this gonna work? So how, does, how is it that he came to Milwaukee? Well, on many of, you know, he had worked in many places. He had worked in, in Chicago earlier, but, but by the end of the 18, during the 1880s, he was working in Chicago again to help prepare for the Chicago World's Fair. And at, at that point, um, he had already designed some work in Chicago, but they were fulfilling some of the things he had done, uh, had, had designed earlier. So he's there in Chicago, and he was there for several years, you know, intensely planning this very big world event. And he was in charge of designing the landscapes. And so someone who happened to be in Milwaukee uh, at the time, who had lived in Chicago for most of his career, Christian Wall, he knew about Olmsted. He knew that Olmsted was down there in Chicago, and he kind of put two and two together. He was also sort of a, a pract practical man. He said, oh, we could probably get Olmsted pretty, pretty cheap. And he uh, says, you won't have to travel across the country. And so Christian Wall, after selling his successful he and his brother had a successful glue business that they sold to the, the armors. 
Um, he returned to Milwaukee and devoted himself to helping um, this fair city, as he had done in Chicago. He had served on the city council and then on the school board there. So, so Christian Wall um, had lived in Milwaukee. He had been. He had. He and his family had fled Germany. Had he was from Bavaria. So he had come here in in 1846. And so then, full circle, he comes back here. And he had a lot of time on his hand. He had a lot of energy still. And he. Um, became the person who really helped move Milwaukee out of this, this uh, debate, which was, went on for 30 years. Should Milwaukee have any uh, real park, public park system and public parks for everyone? What they had before was they had ward parks, where each ward, not even all of the wards had one, but say there would be one circle or square or triangle in that particular ward, and it was very much of a fiefdom. The, the alders of that ward were, were responsible for it, and they, they just didn't think we needed to have parks that were really not neighborhood parks, but for, for everyone. We had beer gardens, we had some amusement parks, we had Forest Home Cemetery, which was akin to the, or the was one of the rural cemeteries, like Mount Auburn in, in Boston, or Concord, uh, Sleepy Hollow, but they were, and then there was the soldier's home, another, another cemetery. So people were recreating on Sundays in the cemetery because there was no other, uh, no other parkland, really, that was major. That was open to everyone. Now, if they could afford it, they'd go to one of, the, one of the beer gardens or something. But people were beginning to say, you know, Milwaukee's, by this time, when the Park Commission was formed in 1889, there were 60 acres of parks for 200,000 people. It's a little bit, little bit of a short, uh, you know, not, not quite living up to its potential. So here we have, there's a bust of Wall Avenue that was just uh, moved recently, and it was rededicated the other night. There's Guy Smith, the, the um, director of Milwaukee County Parks, uh, and Ann Hamilton, who was here today, who's the president of Lake Park Friends. It was a lovely little event. But, but Christian Wall, the reason we were talking about him is that he was, again, he was a visionary. Um, he was a businessman who was very much used to getting things done, but he also just saw the, the need and importance of public parks. So, uh, so, so what, ha what was the, the aesthetic and the concepts that, that then were put into place? Well, the, uh, there's a famous British poet uh, from 1688 to 1744 named Alexander Pope, and he has famously said, consult the genius of the place in all. And so what is the genius of the place? There's a lot of different meanings for that. But basically, it, it talks about the spirit of a place or the character and what is it that makes it special. And that you can sort of find that, feel that, whatever, in all kinds of places. And Olmsted, very, that was very much a guiding principle for him. And so when he came to Milwaukee, he had already known a little bit about these sites, that he, he was given an option of which ones he would design, so they corresponded. And, uh, but he, he already had a little bit of an idea of some of these places, what their character was. But he, um, he, and so he was hired to create a system of parks and parkways, which again was a concept that he had created, so it was, it was a known thing to him, certainly. His, his name and his, his reputation certainly preceded him. But he, um, one of the things that he did, he was, uh, he looked, he already knew about these ravines in Lake Park, and that was very much, and it overlooked Lake Michigan. So he was very attuned to sight. He was so good at things, issues relating to... Okay, great. And can everyone see enough? I hope... So some of what's on the book is, it's okay. And so a lot of it I'll read, like if it's, you know, the words on the, on the page there, I'll be saying them. So you're not going to miss that much if you, so focus on the images. But the, um, so this is a, 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 the, the general plan of Lake Park that Olmsted and his firm um, created after they had visited. Um, the, there's uh, curving roads and, and paths through there. Uh, but what he did is he, he emphasized the lake. That was the, the, focus, the focal point, but he also kept the ravines. He, he, did, he believed it was very similar to Buffalo, that he, he said, hey, you've got these ravines, you've got two levels. In Central Park, they had to create these two levels, this multiple uh, ways to get through the park. But you've got these two levels, you've got this view, this bluff, you know, you got yourself a park. 
uh, it wasn't that he didn't do anything. He certainly planned it out. But he had he could very easily take in a whole landscape. This was something he did with his friend Henry Hobson Richardson, where he would help Henry Richardson to choose uh, the placement of a building sometimes because he just had such a sense of what was going to be happening, where the sun was going to be coming up, what was going on, and this and this. So Olmsted was very much of a spatial uh, thinker, obviously. Now, this is the very first uh, uh, part of Washington Park. This grew. This was They knew that they were going to eventually try to acquire uh, the second um, part of this park, which they did. But this was the, the, first, the first draft of the plan from Wash for Westside Park, which originally um, was outside of the city of Milwaukee. And it took this, this park commission, had to go to the state and get permission to buy parkland outside of the city of Milwaukee, because they were the city of Milwaukee's park commission. But Olmsted, again, he knew that, the, that growth in Milwaukee would happen and that this park would help to attract that growth which it did. And he, so he liked the location of this park, but he also loved the topography. And this is what we'll see when we walk around. There, there is some of the highest points in, in Milwaukee. You could actually see Lake Michigan, which is about you know, six miles away from here. You could see it from the highest points in, Washington, in West Park, West Side Park. Uh, and then here we have the uh, River Park. River, uh, it's, called, it's called River View here. It was Riverside. Uh, later, but it was, you know, this is sort of somebody, I think that the, it was the typo was the postcard maker, um, because it was called River Park, then Riverside. But this is a tunnel that doesn't exist anymore, but Olmsted came up with a scheme to, to take a road under this, the, rail, the railroad and get down to the river and then come back up again and what is now Locust Street. And so this is where Newberry headed all the way down from Lake Park, all the way you know, into Riverside Park, River Park. And what he believed in was this journey, which the journey started down at the lakefront. And it came up through Ravine Road eventually, it, it, and then came down Newberry Boulevard. So it was connecting the lake to the river and then back again. And a very nice flowing journey. This was, uh, Olmsted was all about flowing experiences. So um, the one thing when Olmsted was consulted about these park sites, um, there were seven in total, that he, he said the only thing that he was concerned about was that there was not a central park. There is not a park that was close to downtown Milwaukee. There never was. I mean, there's Cathedral Square. There's a couple of these squares like we talked about. But there's not a big park. And it's kind of a missed opportunity. It was even a missed opportunity when they took down the freeway recently. And I know that my, um, my late friend, Whitney Gould, very, very much lobbied that there would be some of this land set aside for parkland. Milwaukee's always been a little resistant to actually having all the parks it needs. Now, we, may, we say we have so many. We have a lot, but we don't have too many. I think, you know, if you study the Trust for Public Land, we're kind of, we're kind of in a good middle range, but we're not, we're not by any means have too many parks. So, um, so what, one of the things that Olmsted influenced was that he was involved in park planning um, to think about what were the, each of these parks, what were they going to serve? So they, he would, they were going to serve recreation, but they were also meant to conserve and use the natural resources that were within them. So in, in the, they were chosen for those, like this lake, the river, the hills, whatever. The, the woodlands in Washington Park, there was uh, some, nat some native uh, woodlands. Um, but there was also a, ge a diversity of geographic location. Now, this was in part very much thanks to the park commission who knew that this was important. This was important to the city that there be parks for everyone in different parts of the city. And so they did. They created that. And that was the, f that was the concept of a system, but that everyone would be welcome in all of them because these were not going to be neighborhood parks that only the people in that neighborhood were going to use. And that's an, that was a very big concept, and it still is today. Like, I mean, people may say, sometimes they'll say, well, this is, you know, that's in that neighborhood. Well, of course, the people in a neighborhood will use a park, but the, the, ideally, it is serving everyone, and that everyone feels welcome there. And so here we have one of the aspects was the choosing of, of, of places, what, what would be happening in these various 
um, these, these various parks that were being designed. So the river, at that time, Milwaukee River was very clean, and it became the, the destination for all kinds of boating, swimming, swimming schools. Um, there was, the, the river was just, it became a very important destination. Now, the lake was not, um, the lake is still kind of cold, still today, you know, during much of the summer. I swim in Lake Michigan, but, um, but it was also not, it was, you could get to Lake Michigan, but there's a whole other story, and I'll mention it briefly, about the way that we created our, our lakefront. Our lakefront was created. It was not fully what it all, at all what it is today. And this was very much a part of the far-sighted park commissioners. Thank you. Christian Wall, et cetera. So here are some scenes from the, the look at the masses of people. This is at Riverside Park. Um, here then they had, the, across from River, Riverside Park was the Gordon Park bathhouse. Um, Gordon, Gordon Park was named actually for the wife of Charles Whitnell, who we'll hear about in a, in a second. That was her family. So look at all those boats out on Riverside Park. Now, we have cleaned up, we're starting to clean up the Milwaukee River to where there's canoeing and kayaking going on now. There's, there's, a, lot of, there's a lot of work that the Riverkeeper and others have been doing, which is wonderful. Now, here we have the lagoon in Washington Park. Now, this was a created body of water. This was something that was done in a number of, of Milwaukee parks and other parks around the country. The idea of these, these small lakes they became the central um, point of, of uh, enjoyment. There was things that were happening on, on, the, on the lagoon, in the lagoon. Ice skating was the most popular thing that happened in, the, in Washington Park early on. It was, um, then they also did boating in the summer, but it was considered the best place to ice skate. And for a long time, you know, things also have changed now in Milwaukee with weather. We do not have as much ice skating in Milwaukee. But I know that when I was growing up, we did a lot of ice skating. That was in, in Whitnall Park. But there was, so this was a, a, a thing. And, um, but it was also like there was, it was very much the, the beauty of the, of the lagoon that was enjoyed. Here are a few other pictures. So more boating. There was this was um, that there was a boathouse, someone on the with the red roof. That's a, a depiction. It was I think colorized to some extent, but that shape that was uh, very much um, a part of the, the design of the, of the buildings in this park. So now here we are. We're at the senior center here. This is we, we, we were on the site of what was the former zoo. The Milwaukee County Zoo was located right here in Washington Park. Well, how did that happen? It started small because the people, the, the park commissioners, they had requested, they wanted to have a small deer paddock and a paddock for a couple of animals. <laughs> it was one acre, it was in this corner right near here, and then it grew like topsy eventually because zoos became a thing and then people wanted, so we, we got a zoo in Milwaukee. And it took over a good portion of this area of the park. And they also did keep the Olmsteadian landscape within the design of the zoo. And what we'll see when we leave here and we go on the tour is that you can still see the remnants of this Olmsteadian landscape. And it's not even, it's, you're, it's not even clear, like, where was the zoo? Well, it was kind of here, and then they rebuilt this building, and they took, they took the buildings down, so there aren't any zoo-related buildings anymore, and this building itself was built in the 1960s. There was also a freeway that was taken down just to the west of here. I mean, a, a freeway, we're talking about taking it down now, a freeway that took over one full block of Washington Park, and that definitely had an impact on the park. It separated neighborhoods, and it kept, it, it just shaved off a big chunk of the park. Um, this, was, this was done after the, after the zoo left or as it was leaving. So here we are, this is the back of the senior center here. So this is where we are. And that, that area behind here is used for some recreation. And then um, lastly here we have uh, some images of, of Lake Park. Uh, there was a Belvedere there that is not, but, we could, but you can see, you'll be able to see when on the tour and when you go, um, when you're in the park tomorrow, we'll be overlooking this view. There's the bridge um, that is called the Ravine Road Bridge with the teardrop and the circle. 
And, and then lower, um, there's, those are the lion bridges, which are very much a big part of what Olmsted's design for Lake Park was these bridges to traverse the ravines so that we could get through the park and still have that, those, retain those natural areas below. So this is a very um, common scene from, the, from that era, a favorite promenade. So that was Olmsted's idea, is to have a promenade. And in Lake Park, you can promenade all the way about a mile from, from North Avenue all the way to the northern edge of the park. It's about a mile, and it's wonderful. And now that the, that the bridge is open, that is a continuous walkway, what some people have called the spatial spine of the park. And I wasn't sure if Olmsted had said that originally, but it's, a, it's very much, and it's very used. And here, just a couple, just uh, two nights ago, people were running on that promenade. And uh, it's always fun. I'm always curious, like, who's doing what? You know, who is this, who is this group? I don't even know who it was. I was just, I was there for that, uh, that Christian Wall dedication. But here's one person walking in one direction, and then a whole slew of other people coming, <laughs> coming south. So, and then here again is the, the Newberry Boulevard. Here are a couple of different images of it, back a more vintage shot and more, more contemporary. And that, that planting has been changed there to reflect more of what it, what it was uh, historically. And then this is the other end, and there's another marker, and this is the end that's by Riverside Park. So this, this is Newberry Boulevard, which is very much of a park space. You will see people playing ball, doing, you know, whatever. Uh, there's a couple of seating areas in it, and it's it's lovely. It's tr it's a uh, uh, tr very nicely uh, sh tree shade trees, and it really has. Um, to some people consider it one of the nicest boulevards in America. That was what uh, a group, the I think the AIA called it that. So. So one of the things, um, I, I, I really feel that what you can't talk about Olmsted without talking about, about feelings and about the, the whole experience. What he was, what he was always interested in um, was, was what were people, were the experiences that people were going to have. And he very much wanted other people to have the opportunities and the experiences that he had in landscapes. And that it was, and for him, it was very much of a life-saving kind of thing because he suffered from what people now think was manic depression. He had periods of overwork and periods of just where he could hardly get out of bed. But he said, landscape moves us in a manner more nearly analogous to the action of music than anything else. And when I heard, when I read that, I thought that's that's what I that's what I had felt like when I I kind of grew up. I didn't grow up near Washington Park, but I had friends who lived near here in high school, so I was here in this park a lot. I, I a little bit when I was a little bit older, I spent a lot of time in Lake Park, and I moved away for many many decades, and I actually missed those places. So I had this this memory, this sense memory of these places that I, that I missed. And it was because they had somehow moved me. So this is, of course, a scene in uh, that Bow Bridge again in, in, in uh, Central Park. So, so what did Olmsted do? How did he do what he did? I mean, because you can have an idea that you want people to have a good time, but you've got to plan it somehow. And so what he did is he had certain design principles. A lot of you, this is very familiar, I'm sure. But it just for, for the sake of what he was doing in Milwaukee and elsewhere, is that he subordinated all elements to achieving a unified flowing design, a holistic experience as we would call it today. He wanted to create respite within nature to promote well-being for everyone because he knew that when people were in these places that that, that actually could help promote well-being. There was, they were to serve passive recreation for picnic strolling and self-directed play as well as active recreation of sports and different activities. There was never um, an idea that one, there would be one and not the other. And that's another misnomer some, or misunderstanding. Sometimes people will say, yeah, well, there's all that land and it's, you know, it's, it's like, well, you know, it's wasted space, you know. No, it, it really gives people the opportunity to like choose your own adventure. And you can see that. You can see when kids, you know, find a hill and they roll down it. That's called passive recreation. It's active when you see it, but it's, it's a, you know, the term passive may confuse some people. But he also wanted to, this is a quote from spy, uh, Spying on the South, 
that he wanted to, um, that this Tony Horowitz figured out that Olmsted wanted to, to foster the quality of ease, he actually wrote this, that flows from the satisfaction of basic human needs, shelter, shade, prospect, and comfort. And this is it. We all, that's what we all want. And when those, any of those things are missing, that we don't have as good of an experience. And a lot of times we don't know why, but we go, I, I mean, this is, I have a big thing about benches. If there's not benches within a landscape, I figure that people don't want you to sit down. Because if you, if you brought somebody over to your house and you had no furniture, you know, they would think you don't want us to stay, do you? So, you know, but he thought about those things, and I think we can think today. What? How do we? How do we make sure that we have those things? Um, now, he was interested in naturalistic design. It was meant to replicate, not to replicate nature per se, but to to kind of enhance nature, to celebrate nature. Uh, it wasn't always natural, you know, just wildness. It was it was designed. And that's what design is. Um, he also liked this scenic, which was very much, we're gonna hear more about that from, uh, from Patrick Mullins, um, talking about these ideas that were, were popular about scenery. He was very much part of that. Um, but he was, using, they, he was using existing topography whenever, pro, whenever possible. But one of his favorite things was a prospect. And a prospect during the, you know, the, the 19th century was very much into a, a term in vogue, and it meant a high point where you could see far into the distance. Again, that's clearing in the distance, seeing, having distant effects. And so whenever possible, he wanted you to have a long view. And, you know, I've studied enough. When I was working at Fine Gardening, I had the great, you know, fortune to work with in incredible authors who understood these concepts, which is one of the things I wanted to understand myself so I could, I could do a decent job of editing. But one of the ideas is that how, how we are experiencing something is dependent on how, where we are spatially. So there's spatial archetypes. And the idea of a prospect is you do feel enlarged when you're seeing from a, a, from a distance, when you see a big view. So the, the, this fat's a very practical thing, but you can actually promote that. But it's very much of a feeling as well. So, and then the, the natural features were added or enhanced to achieve specific effects. So those, like those lagoons and things like that, trails, whatever. And here's a nice, this is a painting. This is not exactly the way it looked, but this is the ravine, ravine uh, road bridge. This is the ravine underneath it. And uh, once upon a time, the, it, this was even closer in the painting than it was, but this was Lake Michigan. Now, Lake Michigan is much further away now, but that's because the Park Commission got permission to um, fill lake bed so that they could create these buffers that would actually keep Lake Michigan from eroding the, the bluff and all, where all those, those nice homes are that are still there. That's partly because that was a wise, uh, a visionary utopian solution. So that's how we got Lincoln Memorial Drive, which Olmsted did put on the, the, the design, a shore road. So one of the things that um, Olmsted was influenced by, of course, was the the concepts that were in vogue about the beautiful or the pastoral scenic spaces, that was, um, and, and that term meant that, like, he, he interpreted it as open lawn with scattered trees, such as we'll see throughout Washington Park. These, these curving paths where you have a choice. Again, that's another choose your own adventure. It's a very pleasing um, look, these curving paths. Uh, it's not that there are no straight lines in nature, but there's certainly a sense of a more naturalistic uh, line is a curving line often. And here are some of the trees, of course, in, Lake, in Washington Park. And um, there's, there, this is one area where you can just see a little bit of that rolling topography and you know, somebody just sort of wandering through it. I know Dave Boucher, he'll be one of the, leading one of the tours. He said his, his dogs have found certain hollows in the landscape that they especially like in Washington Park. So here's another uh, thing that you can see. This is an, an image of Lake Park, and this is the considered more the picturesque, which is more rugged, um, natural, rustic, irregular scenery. And this was, there was a contrast between the picturesque, which is a little, little, um, little mm, less, less pretty, I suppose, they, you know, as a comparison. And this was something that they, 
Um, they actually were art, um, they were imitating art in some respects, so some of this evolved out of the movements of art movements of that era. And so you've probably seen, you know, things like the Hudson River School. Um, but you can tell, like, there's a certain feeling when you get, like, there's a, here's a, an image of the, the bridge in Washington, one of the bridges in Washington Park, somebody crossing it. And just, you can see in those reflections, some of it's reflected, some of it's uh, the, just the, the trees itself. And so that's a little bit more of a rugged landscape. Yes. Oh, and we have a picture of that above the mantle. And we also have a wonderful rendition, by the way, thanks to Anna Marie Sawkins, of the, of the Henry Singer Sargent painting of Olmsted that hangs in the Biltmore. That's, please enjoy that and take a picture of yourselves with it. So let's see. So we're, we'll, we'll move along here a bit. Um, so this is the lagoon in, in Washington Park. Um, you'll see, this is actually taken a couple of years ago. The, the uh, cattails kind of keep advancing. I'm always a little nervous like the, the cattails are going to eat, <laughs> eat the lagoon. But, um, but there's still there's thing, the fishing that goes on here in Washington Park uh, in the lagoon. It's stocked by the, the DNR. Uh, this is a, it's a posh, pop popular fishing location. There's somebody enjoying his catch. Um, and then there's the, in, in Lake Park, the, the, um, the formal elements, the bridges are the, are the, you know, among the foremost formal elements in Lake Park. And Olmsted did not believe in doing things just for the sake of, of uh, like a, making something a, a pretty without it having a useful purpose. And so the bridges were very, very uh, stylized, they're very beautiful, but they served a function. And here was a shot, and a wonderful little sailboats just happened to be there, you know, with their, in the distance, and there's the line bridges. And this is one of the things, that's, that's that prospect, and this is what we're attracted to. I never get sick of seeing these long views and seeing the sunrise or seeing anything over in that lake. And here's a stylized picture of the sense of connectivity. I include this not because it's actually, it actually looked exactly this way. Uh, this was a, a, an artist rendition. But you can see that sense of flowing movement through Lake Park. Now, connectivity, as I mentioned, was very big in, in, in Olmsted's uh, vernacular. And the idea of circulation, he wanted people to have pleasing experiences. That meant that you have, you, if, if you start on a journey, you're going to go in a, in a way that you're going to come back around somehow. You're not going to just have dead ends. You're not going to have jarring experiences. And again, that allows the mind to have a quality of ease. And this is something that when it's done well, you don't have to think about it. Something that's really designed well, you don't have to sit and think about, like, how did they do that? Because you're just enjoying it. And that's what he did. But pathways and roads were, often they were curving with scenes unfolding. He wanted you to have a vague memory of a scene and that you would experience it again later. But he didn't want there to be just one thing where you just had to go see that one thing and, and in, in a park or in a landscape. Now here, this was the, uh, the wonderful streetcar station in Lake Park, which does not exist anymore. But, but look at there were they would bring hundreds of maybe thousands of people into the park, especially on the Sunday. That was, you know, I'm, I don't know what people did the rest of the week, but you know, the people had only, they had one day off often. So now here we have more, we have multimodal experiences in parks. This is where we have a bike station, we have a bus stop. There's, uh, you know, roadways on the, on the bottom. This is one of the many parkways in Milwaukee. Now, the parkways um, was a concept, again, Olmsted developed. This is Ravine Road, which is currently uh, closed, and you maybe hear some about that uh, during your time here. Um, and here's Washington Park. They were always uh, in places meant for people to gather. And this is what, um, this is what happens for, for these big events, but it also it, it was a site of a lot of um, there were protest rallies and marches that, that happened that happened at start here. This is back in the day when they had music under the stars and there were thousands of people that, that sat on those benches uh, throughout the summer. So, and these are some of the current events. I love the bubble machine. Some, some uh, enterprising person created a, on his bike, he created a bubble machine and the kids just love it and, they, and, the, and the adults too. 
So they're, they're, he's out there all, week after week, you know, entertaining. And I think that's part of this com community spirit is sharing. I love here. This is this is Goethe and Schiller. You know, uh, this is on the. You can see the one on the bottom. That's the full the full view. But this. This uh, little harbor here, it was not designed by Olmsted, but it's placed within the park in such a way it views the band shell, but it also is like people love, again, to just do whatever they want there. And you've got a whole bunch of people gathering who probably don't even know each other, just sort of like in the same vicinity. And I think that's important. It's important that people actually are being together in ways you don't have to know each other, but you can experience each other as as sharing uh, this, this civic space. And here's a popular uh, Lake Park Friends Monday, Musical Mondays that's been going on for decades. And they, uh, they have a Wednesday concert series as well, but this is the, the very big one on Monday nights. And this is a different concert series, but there's a lot of dancing that goes on in different, in different places, kids running around. I think it's like, I like to call it free range kids. Like if a really good um, park space where people can actually feel comfortable having their kids do whatever you know, that they would do. Like I grew up in the country, so we were free range because we had a lot of land, but we were you know, working, we were working farmers. But I, had the, I was able to do, to, to walk, um, to the playground at the school. We didn't even go to the school, but the, the playground behind our farm. But, you know, there's a, a lot, not, not a lot of opportunities for today for kids to be able to just be in places where they can just roam a little bit. So now, uh, one of the things that we'll, we'll talk about here, um, that there's a very important legacy. I think Lincoln Memorial Parkway is very much a legacy of Olmsted. I didn't know that at first because I, you have to really study, you have to look at this design. He designed a shore drive that went along, along the lakefront, but it wasn't then possible that there would have been a, a drive that's as big as it is and as wide and such. But he, um, as a result, the, the, and, and probably in planning with the park commissioners, they decided eventually, it took decades to do this, but they, they, they uh, filled this lake bed, created enough land, they were given the permission by the state, they were given grants to create beaches, parks, and a, a boulevard. And that's what became the Lincoln Memorial Drive. Now I hope, I don't know if that you will be officially taken on that tour, but we'll be able to see it from Lake Park. And also I hope while well, you're here that you get a chance. It's a beautiful boulevard and it's, it's also used now as part of the Oak Leaf Trail, which is part of the um, here's, here's a person who's walking on the more trail aspect of it. There's, that's a, to, no, the north end near Kenwood Boulevard. So there's some other influences in Milwaukee that Olmsted was indirect, and that was with his, uh, his firm, the sons, John Charles Olmsted and Frederick Olmsted Jr. John Charles came to Milwaukee with, um, with his father. Um, he also brought with him Warren Manning, Warren H. Manning, um, who was the planting designer in Milwaukee and also later on continued to consult with the Park Commission for about another 10 years. He was considered um, the first um, environmental planner and he was a designer of wild gardens and uh, was very much influenced in Milwaukee, um, very completely under, uh, under known, underappreciated. He, was, he designed the, the uh, sunken garden at Mitchell Park which was uh, connected, and at that time it related to the, the original conservatory, and then it's still uh, related to when they rebuilt, they rebuilt, uh, they built the new conservatory, the domes. And so that was another legacy, uh, indirectly, that Olmsted had brought Warren Manning to Milwaukee. He also designed another um, park, Kosciusko, this is the Mitchell Park. He has the same sort of naturalistic rolling hills of both of those parks. This, that this image is of, of um, Mitchell Park, and then this is of Kosciusko on the south side, which was, again, one of those first seven parks that were designed as part of the original mini system of parks here. So in Milwaukee, uh, we'll, we'll uh, wrap this up here in the next bunch of images. Uh, so the Olmsted was a trailblazer, and then he and the other designers that he was associated with, they played uh, significant roles in these early um, design concepts, but then that was built upon by later park makers, park visionaries. And 
Some of the, so these, um, the whole park system in Milwaukee is, uh, is eligible for the National Register of Historic Places. And it's, and it's partly, Lake Park itself is on the National Register, but it's, uh, the park system was influenced um, as a system countywide, and that was part of the planning. This is an uh, image of Charles V. Whitnall. He's considered the father of Milwaukee County Parks, which, uh, which was his role in the, the um, planning of, this, of the countywide park system. But he built upon those ideas that Olmsted had developed. Again, the, originally, the concept of a park system was in Buffalo. This is what um, all, uh, Charles Whitnall built upon as a countywide plan in 1923. Again, this is about 30 years after, after Olmsted was here. Um, that, th this is a, an image of the parks throughout, throughout the system. The, the Oak Leaf Trail follows this. All of those parkways followed the natural waterways of Milwaukee, which was, again, a concept that Olmsted often did the, of the, in the parkway. So these are some of, of the, uh, the things that they, that they created. Charles uh, Alfred Berner was the first landscape architect to be hired by the county. He worked directly with Whitnall, and then they, and he was, again, he was a student of landscape architecture in a profession as it was just being created and uh, very influential, Berner Botanical Garden. And so he used a lot of these same ideas in his designs of many, many parks in Milwaukee. This was also part of the CCC, uh, Civilian Conservation Corps era. And uh, so this is where I, I, can, I contend that we are seeing the results of the, the uh, foundation of Olmsted and then that it was built upon. So whether it was, um, we'll, just, we'll just quickly see a few more images that some of which you've already seen, these vistas, um, this curvy, these curving lines, natural materials. That was very much a part of what Berner did. Um, and so they, these characteristics were established early on, and they've been retained pretty much over time. And it's up to us to sort of make sure that they continue to be retained and appreciated. So there's one other person who, even though he was um, not he came to Milwaukee before Olmsted, but we're looking at Horace Cleveland. He designed Juno Park, and one of the things he said, look forward a century to the time when the city has a population of a million and think what will be their wants. And I think this is where we are today. We'll see what the, these are some of the images of what people are doing in parks today. Uh, especially during COVID, people were using parks like crazy. They were sending messages to each other and the, part, and the things they created in the beach, on the sand. Um, this is uh, something, and, and here's what people do today. They, they come, they use the parks, they are there for everyone. And these are, um, this, is how, this is how we adjust. Now we've had renamings of parks. This is Indigenous Peoples Park in Milwaukee County. Uh, some of the, some of the uh, well, recent awareness is how do we incorporate more history, things that have been not appreciated, incorporated. So we are, are going to wrap up close to where we started, where this is a, a bluff in, in Lake Park. In a vision, um, I like to think, I don't know, I love seeing these, these different sunrises and it's like some, some apparition over there. And here's a bench in Washington Park. We'll, we'll see some scene like this or another. Um, the lagoons, some of the view sheds are not as visible as they could be, but here's one that's, that's nicely articulated and uh, they're enjoying it. And I certainly have enjoyed this opportunity today and I want to thank you all for being here for your attention and for celebrating Parks for All People. So I, I have a few more acknowledgments of names but I'll just honor them, all the people that have stewarded these, these parks for all these, these uh, decades. So, okay, so thank you Dee Dee. Well, thank you very much, Virginia. We are, have now had our appetite whetted, and we're going to be ready for a wonderful tour later today. So with this, why don't we all take a little stretch while we bring on our next panel, and we will keep the show on the road. <laughs>